I guess today burst on the scene as the sexy werewolf Alcide on HBO's True Blood. Now he's playing a more theatrical beast, taking on the role of Stanley Kowalski in A Streetcar Named Desire at Yale Repertory Theater. Please welcome Joe Manganello. How you doing? I'm doing great. Look at you on the stage. How about that? Now, first of all, I have to say you're, you're the biggest guest I've had. You're the biggest person sitting in this chair. So uh, you, you, you've already uh, set a record. Thank you. And I think Kristen Chenoweth was the smallest. Probably. And I'm picturing her like next to you. And we I could like, probably fit on this chair together. She, she could, <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. She, she, yeah. she could sit on my shoulder. <laughs> I would love that, actually. That'd, yeah. be, that'd be fun. Next time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you are in New Haven, mm -hmm. and you are rehearsing a, a little return to the stage. Yes. How did this come about? I know you've, you've been kind of itching to show people you're more than just a badass werewolf, haven't you? <laughs> I, I mean, I guess if you put it that way. I, I mean, you know, theater was, was what I started doing. It was yeah. what, I, what I did every day, all day, at the beginning of my career that right. nobody saw when nobody cared. And, uh, and so, you know, the project like True Blood and, and things like Magic Mike, you know, my schedule gets so crazy that I haven't been able to go back and, and do a play in four years since yeah. the show started. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, you just, you get itchy to, to get up there and, and kind of flex those, those muscles. It's, yeah. it's completely different. So um, I was bugging my manager for the past year, like, please, let's find something. And uh, she found Yale's streetcar. <laughs> and this is like, this is the role. I mean, this is an amazing role. Yeah. And the minute everybody heard you were going to play this role, it was like, well, that sounds perfect. Well, I, that, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, you know, it's actually the, the third time I've played it. Okay, third. So, I, I knew about one production. I found photos online of one production. You did, yeah. You only did that for like a week, like five, five summers ago. Uh, yeah, five years ago, I did it at West Virginia for one of my old uh, Carnegie Mellon professors right. who directed it, and he said, you know, there's a catch. We're only going to have one week to rehearse in the space Wow. once we get there. So uh, I said, okay, and I uh, spent about a month prepping on my own and then got in, and the second we got there, it was, you're going here, you're going there. We learned the blocking, and a week wow. later, we were up. Wow. Uh, so that was crazy. Um, and then prior to that, in college, the senior directors, I think maybe when I was a sophomore, their project that they got to do to direct scenes from was Streetcar. Hmm. And I think every single one of the directors but two cast me as their Stanley. So I wound up doing almost the entire play. Wow. Then. <laughs> uh, and then a year ago, actually, um, John Levy, the casting director, called me up and said, um, he and Bill Macy were putting together a staged reading of Tennessee Williams' Small Craft Warnings, which is a play about, it was one of Tennessee's later plays, yeah. and he was, I think, really drunk at the time he was right. writing it. It was, you know, and uh, it, it's, it's kind of a collection of all of his characters, kind of shadow forms of his characters, yeah. just really washed up at this bar drunk on the PCH, and I played the drunk and washed up version of Stanley in that one, so... Oh, wow, okay. It just keeps, me and this part just keep following each other. Yeah. Now your director is Mark Rucker, who directs mm -hmm. a lot up at Yale. What is it like sort of digging into, obviously it's something sort of in your bones, maybe a little bit, right? Yeah, I, I know the play inside and out, but what's interesting is that at these different stages, seeing what jumps out at me. Or, um, because every time, you know, I'm in a different phase of development yeah. as a person, so yeah. different things in the play are going are gonna to stick out to me. And, I think the big thing this time around was I was really, um, really shocked at how much empathy or, or pathos I, I felt for Blanche mm. reading it this time, where I think the other times I had performed it, it was like, you know, I'm going to have my way, this is my character's subjective, uh -huh. and, and this time I really fell for her, and I think um, it's translating into a much more, um, I guess, a much more... Like it's it's another layer. Obviously, a lot of great actors have have taken on this part. Mm -hmm. um, is it sort of do you like feel like you're like joining a club of <laughs> you know guys doing this? I, to, I mean, yes and no. Um, you know, I, I I stay away from like you know uh, Blue Jasmine's out right now, yeah. and I'm like just staying away from it until I get done with the run. Right, because you know, it's I don't, inspired by Streetcar. Yeah, yeah, I don't want anything in, in my mind. Um, and, and I remember the last time I, I did Streetcar, I, I watched the Brando version after mm. and was just surprised at how different. Yeah, you said he wasn't really like nailing a lot of the lines. and. Yeah, and, and I think at the time, you know, he's, he was rebelling against an acting style. He was, right. he was like rebelling against an entire system that was this presentational stage 
right. theater, right. acting. You know, they put up cameras and people acted theater. Right. Right. And, and he was rebelling. He was turning his back and covering his face and right. mumbling. Right. And, and so I think there was this uh, kind of rebellious nature that was almost, uh, I think, sometimes put in front of maybe the choices in the play, mm -hmm. let's say. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, I hope, you know. Right. I don't, you know, <laughs> Brando fans don't come after me for right. saying that. But I think that there was, uh, and I think that, that I, I'm not constrained by that need to rebel against the system. And, and I actually get to, to play the play. And I think that there's people that maybe think that they know the play um, maybe will be surprised seeing it at, at how, how funny Stanley is. Mm. I mean, it's written in a really funny way. Hmm. I mean, there's there's some really funny stuff in there mixed in with this kind of maniacal, crazy, psychotic um, rage. Right. Um, you know, there's there, but there are a lot of different layers. I think that that maybe Brando didn't get to explore fully. Uh huh. And everyone, of, everyone's of course waiting for your Stella. I mean, that's how you know. Like, there's certain yeah. moments in the plays. Like, you've got to, like <laughs> I, I can't imagine as an actor when you get to that moment. It's like. Uh, yeah, I'm going to say it now. This, this is the line. Well, I think by the time you get to that, and I think this is kind of that, you know, I think this is, this is that side that, that maybe people f feel like they know it or think that they know it, but, you know, in that moment, he has just beaten his pregnant wife while drunk, yeah. blacked out, um, come back, and, and find she's not there. She's left him. Right. And there's kind of this, this boyish... Yeah, scared that he's been left, and 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 then this this apology from the depths of his soul, his gut. There's, there's no faking it. Yeah. And so by the time you get there on stage, I mean it's 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 the most raw moment I think that's ever been written. And so, you know, when people come up to me on the street and they're like, "Come on, do the Stella. Come on, give it to me. Give it. You know, it's like get out of my face. You know, like, you know, come see the play because it's you know it can't be it just can't be duplicated. And you're gonna rock a wife beater. That is part of this. <laughs> I don't know. You know, I think um, Mark wants to stay away from from the wife beater. Yeah, like I wear a long sleeve, like a sweater. <laughs> I'll be wearing a, a cardigan, <laughs> a Mr. Rogers sweater. Uh, <laughs> it's a completely different day. No, you know, Mark actually jokingly says uh, he's gonna stick up signs in the lobby that say, any shirtlessness in this play was written by Tennessee Williams, <laughs> not directed by me. Like, it's in the play, it's not my fault, you know. When I saw it on Broadway, um, with uh, Blair Underwood, the women went crazy. It actually took away from the, the play because the audience was like, you know, screaming and howling. It's like, hey, wait, 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 this is actually a, a drama. Well, but, but I think, you know, in that, in that moment, uh, you know, what's so great about it is that, you know, I think, and this is coming from, you know, magic mic research and, you know, yeah. my, my male stripping past. Uh, you know, men, when men try to be sexy, they, they, they're not. <laughs> men can't try to be sexy. Right. It just doesn't work. Right. You know, male stripping being the greatest evidence. It's like, <laughs> you, you got to put on a fireman suit and just make a joke out of it. You right, know? right. Um, and so I think, you know, in the moment where his shirt comes off, it's, it has to be born out of necessity hot, humid, this is how it is in here. Right. And I think out of that not being sexy, you have women screaming at, at Blair Underwood. <laughs> you know, but, but it creates such a, a nice moment, and I think that you know, audiences screaming at, the, at that moment gives, it helps the actress playing Blanche so much right. because in that moment right. there right. has to be that right. level of attraction yeah. that then gets threaded to the end. Yeah. Uh, and, and that that completely helps it. So you know, anybody coming to see the play, like let's, you know, all, all that that wildness or fun is is definitely going to help the play. So. But you might be in a turtleneck. We might just totally re <laughs> we're going to redo this whole thing. Yeah, totally. <laughs> <laughs> turtleneck, and that's it. <laughs> just a turtleneck. Just a turtleneck <laughs> and socks. So take me yeah. back a little bit. You grew up in Pittsburgh. I did. Yeah. You were Judd Fry in Oklahoma in high school. Yes. Uh, that that that's a that. How was your lonely room? <laughs> That's like your big solo. I mean, yeah. Roger Hammerstein. Yeah, it was. Uh, I I don't I don't know. I mean, I, I maybe cats were screeching in the, in the <laughs> off in the, the alleyway behind the theater. I mean, when you put a gun in my head, yeah. yeah. I think I think I was I was. Yeah, I know. I I I I've been told by oh, yeah? lots of people at karaoke that I have a voice. And I mean, it's nothing that that I pursued. You, you don't know? drink, so that'd be sober karaoke. <laughs> yeah, totally. it's sober it's a way to go. Yeah. That's impressive. Yeah, uh, there's no other way. Um, no, so uh, but yeah, that was that was kind of how it started. But that's what's available to you in high school, right? You know, right. It's the, the senior year musical, and and I 
I didn't start taking acting classes till till senior year. So senior year, I was just okay. big jock right. dude in the freshman level acting class with all these little turtleneck wearing <laughs> actor kids, and uh, and the teacher uh, just kept begging me, please try out for the musical, please, please. And I went, oh come on, singing and dancing, what are you crazy? And she goes, no, please. And I tried out and got the part. And wow, why did you? make that switch what to get girls or what was the a lot of guys <laughs> guys say that i mean they do there's a lot of pretty girls in the theater classes that don't have guys to that's true fool around with but there's like pretty <laughs> cheerleaders too you know i mean yeah, there's different true. you know ways to, to different ways to skin the cat uh in high school but uh no i i had an artistic side when i was a kid um uh, I was very, you know, sensitive, empathetic, artistic, drawing, painting, creating characters, right. writing stories. That's just how right. I was. And it drove my father crazy because he was, you know, like the toughest guy in the world. Uh -huh. Grew up right down the street from the projects in Boston. And his uh, son was huge right. and going to be this athlete in Western Pennsylvania. And, uh, you know, and I was good at sports and I was always the captain, but my heart was always in the arts. Huh. And so I spent this good solid 10 years being an athlete and pushed aside that artistic side. Right. And when I got to high school, I think, you know, the idea of being in theater club for me was a bit daunting. Um, but my high school had a TV studio and they had cameras that you could borrow on the weekend. And so I started sneaking the cameras out and sleeping with a pad and a pen next to my bed and writing these stories and, and scripts and dialogue and I'd wake up and start scratching out. And I'd what were they up, like? Like sci-fi Mafia, horror. kung fu, martial oh, art movies. <laughs> nice. <laughs> you still have those those movies? Oh yeah. Have yeah. you ever, you should upload some of them to YouTube. I know one of them is uh, probably the 20th anniversary I think is this year. The one. So yeah, my friends are like, you gotta convert <laughs> that. And I'm like, no, no one will ever see this, you know. <laughs> What's that one called? That one's called, uh, it was Young Dragon, The Search for Bruce Lee's Killer. My friend was this martial awesome. artist who was born in Vietnam, my buddy Paul. And uh, I was just black belt in several martial arts, and he did all the martial arts choreography, and he was the student of Bruce Lee, and then I was this mafioso who had these henchmen, <laughs> and I sent out <laughs> to kill him, and we made this big hour and a half long, you know, feature movie. But I, I realized, like, I, I loved it, yeah. you know, and I was, you know, waking up before the sun came up to go out and shoot all day, and I just, I knew there was something to that, uh -huh. and uh, and so my friends, when we were shooting these movies, were all saying, "Man, you know, you should, you should." You should try acting, man. That you're good at this, and I'm like, get out of here. Huh. But, but I wound up taking a class, and um, and then it wound up leading to, well, the Carnegie Mellon, and then everything else. And you you now have a production company. Is there a mm -hmm. little part of you that wants to maybe turn that into a real Hollywood film? That that the search for Bruce Lee's killer. That, that could, <laughs> come on, that'd be awesome. It's right, gonna I'll, haunt I'll you I'll now. Think, you're gonna I'll think, think about, about this. it. Yeah, I know. I'm gonna go home and try to figure it out. <laughs> so you ended up at Carnegie Mellon, a <laughs> very prestigious school. And I mean, so many Carnegie Mellon graduates uh, are in the Broadway world. Hey, Zach Quinto getting ready to do exactly Fast Menagerie, Fast Menagerie. another Tennessee Williams play. I know you said you played a lot of like edgy guys at Carnegie Mellon. Like, yeah, there was this crazy play called Polaroid Stories, and I played a character named Skinhead Boy, who was this meth head skinhead, wow, tattooed up, you know, kind of crazy guy. And so I, you know, shaved the head bald and did that. I was in um, freshman year. I did John Guare's Lighty Breeze, which is an insane play. It's like uh, this kid who was raped as a child by his mother figure and given syphilis. Wow. And then he had his tooth chipped on a bottle, and it became this like kind of disfigurement to him. And then he wound up as becoming an actor who played Frankenstein in a staged version of Frankenstein. Wow. Great, by John Guare. I don't know this one. And so he comes back to confront this woman who gave him syphilis. And wow. he's starting to go crazy. And, so I and shaved, you were toothless for that. Shaved my head bald and I had two fake front teeth. So you could getting, just take them out? Well, not that easy. I, I, got, I went to the cafeteria and got a loaf of oh French God. bread. And oh I had to like God. work it out. And I popped the tooth out. Would that, is that method acting? Is that? I, mean, <laughs> I don't know what that is, man. That's just, I don't know. It's you know. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, it was my freshman year and all the teachers kept saying, you know, they kept, you know, talking to me about, you know, you're going to, you're going to do soap operas and that's, you uh, know, and, and, and not, there's nothing right. wrong. You know, I mean, right. there's, you know, Denzel Washington and Matt Bohm. I mean, it's, you know, but there was something, I think there was something about trying to be categorized mm. by the way that I looked, right. that didn't really jive. And I thought, if I'm there, I want, I want, I want to play weird parts. Like I want, I don't want them to just give me, right. you know, boring, handsome guy, 
right. parts or something, which is kind of, I think, where they were right. trying to, to go with. And and uh, and so I shaved my head bald and ripped my tooth out and put an end to that. <laughs> wow. But I didn't tell my scene partner that uh, I was going to do that. I wore a ski hat and I polygripped my tooth in in the morning. And uh, I went backstage and pulled it out and pulled oh the hat God. off. <laughs> And she went out and had to do this monologue, this flowery monologue. And when at the end of her monologue, my character comes out, uh -huh. and I come up to her. And when I came out, she looked up. You scared the shit out of her. I could see in her <laughs> eyes. It was like horrified. <laughs> and I come up, and I had to. We rehearsed this choke where I put my hands around her throat, and you know, of course, it's a stage choke, so she has her hands on the inside. She's right. controlling it. I'm not even touching her neck, but I went in like that, and I am choking her, and. <laughs> Like her eyes rolled back and she started yelling, Joe, stop, stop it, Joe, you're hurting me, stop. And I, and everybody rushes out of the crowd and they start grabbing me. You like, just lost your mind? Get off of me, yeah. And, and, uh, and the teachers were like, get him out of here. And they threw me out and all these teachers asked me if I needed psychiatric help. And there was talk about whether or not I was going to be kicked out of the school. And it was this whole big ordeal. And I'm like, I didn't even, you don't. But what was going even, on in your head? You were just really in it? I just was like, what the hell, what just happened? I was kind of in shock, you know? And, and there was a part of me that suspected what happened and it was confirmed the next year when I came back to school. I was invited back and I was walking down the hall at the beginning of the next year, no one else in the hallway but that girl. Uh -huh. And we both walked down the hall and stopped right in the middle. And she looked down at the ground and went, I forgot my line. I'm like, you. Wow. I knew it. Where is she now? Anyway, uh, I don't know. I think she was doing uh, singing on a cruise ship or something. That's like <laughs> the, the whole school like turned on you in a moment. That's yeah, like, it wasn't even my fault. Wow. But whatever. So they were like, grow your hair back, put your teeth back in, and stop it. And but like, you know who does like that kind of energy? HBO, right? <laughs> yeah, apparently. Yeah, so. yeah see that. <laughs> well, I mean, so let's talk about True Blood for for a minute. You, yeah. I know they just announced that True Blood is one more season. Mm -hmm. It's done. Yeah. Uh, is that, how does that feel? Knowing you're entering the last season. Well, I mean, it's 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 mixed. Um, you know, it, it's uh, that show has done wonders for me. I mean, course, changed, changed yeah. my life. I mean, completely. And uh, and but there's there's a level of um, sadness for saying goodbye to, to those people yeah. and, and, and having this family and you know. But on the other side of it too, there's there's kind of you know there's an excitement as to what's yeah. out there. You know. Um, you know, I haven't been able to do a play in four years, and in a year from now, I'll be able to do whatever I want. So a lot of theater exciting. people on that set. Lot, True Blood has a lot of theater people. Everybody. Of those, yeah, I think it's, it's, awesome. de it's deceptively tricky that material, and I think that people kind of don't realize that they can. It's easy to dismiss as this werewolf vampire show. Yeah, you know, fairies and things, but but it's um it's deceptively tricky. I mean, it's very, it's very Tennessee Williams at points. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you know, this yeah. kind of hot Louisiana, yeah. steamy. I think that's what that, hooked me into it the first season. I mean, yeah. that that energy. Yeah, I think if if Tennessee Williams was alive, he he'd be oh he'd be all over that. He'd be he'd be he'd definitely be a Joe <laughs> Manganiello fan. Probably also because of there's this other thing you did called Magic Mike, which you already mentioned. Tennessee um, Williams would approve. He would have loved that movie. Yeah. Um, what was the name of that guy you played? Big Dick Ritchie. Big Dick Ritchie. Yes. Now, Big Dick Ritchie. <laughs> They want to make a Broadway musical out of Magic Mike. You've heard I, of this, so I right? hear. Yeah, they, I knew Soderbergh wanted to do that. He was like, "This would be a great musical." What do you imagine Big Dick Ritchie's like big musical moment? Can you picture like what maybe what if you were going to expand and give him a big <laughs> number? What would he sing about? What I mean, I mean, I guess he'd be like the bass, the bass voice, and he'd come <laughs> yeah, out. And uh, just, yeah, he'd yeah. probably just bust into Big Dick this, Ritchie. <laughs> yeah, just sing a song about his dick, pumping maybe. Pumping, yeah. Be, be, be about there would be. Well, I think there'd be giant. <laughs> The, the, the chorus would come out in the back, there'd be maybe like a kick line of <laughs> giant penis pumps or something. You know? And they would pump, and as they pumped, they would just rise up <laughs> or into the rafters. Like some, maybe some like Spider Man, they could do some rigging. You will not be in this musical. Magic Mike the if musical. If they do the number that way, I would. I would, you would definitely are you get, kidding? You're yeah. in? You're in? Singing and dancing penis <laughs> That's pumps? That's how you get them like, in there. <laughs> I'm in. Singing and dancing penis pumps is the. <laughs> Done. <laughs> <laughs> um, you have a book coming out. I do. Which I think is pretty cool. Thanks. Uh, it's called Evolution, right? Yes. Your publisher said that this book will turn any average Joe into a Joe uh, Manganello. I think somebody else wrote that, but. Yeah, I'm sure. Right. I, I, I didn't think that was actually. <laughs> so are you saying that if I read this book, I, mm -hmm. I could end up looking 
like Big Dick Richie? <laughs> <laughs> Is that what you're promising people? I'm saying that that if you do what's in the book step by step, yeah, you know the diet, the cardio, the workouts. Um, in six to eight weeks, you're going to look in the mirror and not even recognize yourself. Wow. Completely transformed. So what made you, obviously, because of True Blood, you're naked on True Blood. So obviously, and then you're naked in Magic Mike. So, so people have seen your body. There's a lot of talk about your body. So obviously, you, I'm assuming somebody <laughs> came to you and said, hey, do you want to make like a, work? like how did this happen? Like, I, it seems like you've turned maybe what was a potentially dirty opportunity into a really cool book. <laughs> I don't know. Like yeah, people no, look, that's a good way. You know to what put I mean? People want to look at pictures of you with your shirt off. Yeah. It, it, well, it was it was it was a uh, an incoming call from from Simon and Schuster. Right. And they wanted to, um, you know, they wanted to make a workout book. And and I think that the initial idea was, yeah, let's let's sell some pictures of this guy shirtless. Right. And I said, well, you know, I'm not really interested in in, in that book right. per se. Yeah. Um, because I've I've spent a lot of time working out, yeah. and and I think I've had some really uh, unusual obstacles that I think people would be very surprised about uh, that that I had to get over right. to get there, and so I have a lot to say, and I said so give me a couple of weeks and let me just let me put together this this treatment this outline and um, I'll send you my writing sample and if you're interested in making that book then then great and if not then maybe this. Maybe this right. isn't the right thing, right. Uh, or the right opportunity. And so I spent a few weeks, and I, I wrote you know, a few pages, sent it back to them, <clears throat> and they called back, and they, uh, they, in, they doubled my advance so that I could they get the photographer, the get the thing. And they said, you know, like, yeah, we want to, we, we awesome. think this needs to be said in the marketplace. You know, I'm not here to sell you some, you know, gimmicky program right. that's going to make these uh, absurd promises uh -huh. that, that are never going to be able to follow through or you know those those late night infomercials are the best when you know people are on there selling some product and you can tell the people working out on them their body right. was not created right. by this product. Right. you know these are the workouts that 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 I used for Trubo these are the workouts I used for Magic Mike this is the exact same stuff but it also combines the um, uh, the the inspirational side of it, the the mental side. I mm -hmm. mean, training is so mental. Anybody can pick up a weight and do this with it, but what keeps you there? You know, mm -hmm. what is it that people have in their mind where they set a goal and then can't achieve it? Right. You know, and I get into that, and I think it's easy for somebody to sit on a couch and point their finger and go, "Well, that guy has genetics, and that guy had it easy, and that's why." Right. That's not true right. in my case at all. And I've never done a steroid. I've never touched a human growth hormone. So I'm not promising that you're going to look at me by doing this workout and then right. I'm doing all this other stuff. It's not. It's, it's completely natural. So You were um, not born this way. No, not at all. And, and in fact, a, the book starts with a picture I of me then. That. <laughs> right, a little skinny, skinny guy. Yeah, and, uh, which I think will surprise people. And, um, and so, you know, Simon & Schuster was completely on board. Um, and then I wound up uh, meeting... And shooting a movie with Arnold Schwarzenegger, and he agreed to write the foreword. Yeah, that's pretty insane. He wrote your foreword. foreword. Yeah, that really choked me up when I got to the end of it. The, the stuff that he said about me and all of those years sitting in the movie theater, going to see his movies, and the fact that that, that guy wrote that about me. You know, it's like regardless of whatever happens the rest of my life, like I'll, I'll always have that. Wow. And yes, there's lots of pictures in it. So <laughs> you will get the pictures. <laughs> there's too. tons of pictures, but then you actually get some some content subversively. And you say that you were a guy who was like drinking and sort of like like ten years like what ten years ago you were in a much lower place. <clears throat> yeah, I you know I I was uh, you know in high school and then and then definitely in drama school I just was that guy you know I wanted to be. I want to be Gary Oldman or you know Jim Morrison or you know uh -huh, whatever. Yeah. I wanted to be that kind of drunken, chain-smoking theater artiste kind right. of dude, and I tried to make it work for me, and I just wasn't. Unfortunately for me, or right. fortunately, I'm just not built that way. Yeah, and uh, and I had to. I got to a really, really bad, bad place where I had no other choice but to let it go, and uh, and that was a really rocky road which I talk about in the book quite a bit wow. um, in some of the, 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 the first few chapters um, but yeah it, it had to go and, and who knew that you know 11 and a half years ago that chain smoking bottle of whiskey a day drinking guy would be writing the book on fitness that right. would stand on Arnold's books shoulders right. you know I mean who knew that was in there I, I, I certainly didn't
you also started a production company with your brother, and you're yeah. making a documentary about a stripper, a, yeah. a male stripper in Dallas, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, about about, about all, the, all these guys. About Not all these guys. Well, it's like the real life Magic Mike. I mean, right. you know, when we got done with Magic Mike. The one thing that people said to me were, was. Uh, you know, I, I wanted to see more of the guys, and I wanted to right. know more about them. Right. So we went down and filmed, and what we found was the documentary just takes this complete turn wow. into, um, I mean, very topical territory. Um, there's a there's a Trayvon Martin component mm. to to this documentary. Um, you know, I think it's it's easy to see that world as fun and and funny, mm -hmm. um, but it is where the underworld bubbles up mm -hmm. and sometimes it bubbles up and 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 takes someone and uh and we uncovered this story that uh it's just I, I don't think there's going to be a dry eye in the house that's another thing i'm super excited about i'm looking forward to that i'm looking forward to the book that's going to transform my body yep. i'm looking forward to the mafia kung fu <laughs> movie you're going to make all come right. on just do it all right i gotta get on this but right. also <clears throat> a streaker named desire i'm so excited mm -hmm. you start uh september 20th we start previews September twentieth. Opening night is the twenty sixth of September. We run through August or October twelfth. October twelfth. Yeah. yeah, I can't yeah. wait. It's like it's my favorite play, and, and the cast is amazing. And, and Mark's had such an unbelievable director, and, and the material is. I mean, it's my favorite play of all time. Well, so, thank you so much for being here. For uh, maybe me. Broadway someday. You, you want to do Broadway? Well, right? as soon as True Blood's over, my schedule will open up, and then starting a year from now, I guess. We'll, we'll figure something out. Awesome. Well, we'll see you yeah. back on the on the white pleather chair when you're on when you're on Broadway. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time.